Welcome to Your Week with St. Luke's and our podcast with Dr. Eric Moore, who is a postdoctorate fellow at Candler School of Theology and an expert in the Book of Acts. Today's episode, we will take a look at what it means to learn together and devote ourselves as the early church did to one another and the apostles' teaching. Let's get going. Hello, it's good to be with you all again. Um, I was reminded that last week I didn't formally introduce myself. My name is Eric Moore. I am a PhD in New Testament. I work currently as a postdoctoral fellow in academic affairs at Candler School of Theology, which is part of uh, the larger uh, academic ecology of Emory University. Um, I'm glad to be with you again, as I mentioned. Today we are discussing Acts 2. Let me back up a little bit. Uh, I mentioned some of this in our last lecture that I thought it might be helpful to repeat. Just the consideration of what Acts is as a narrative. Uh, We talked about a couple different possibilities. The one that I really like, because it's not just restricted to matters of genre, is looking at Acts as an origin story. I think we all know this implicitly. This is a story that tells the origins or beginnings of the uh, story of the Christian church. How was it that this small group of followers of Jesus that were centered in Judea and Galilee originally, if we look at the Gospels, how was it that they came to be part of a network of churches that were spread out around the Mediterranean world? So that's what I see if we just look at the story of Acts. That's what I think it is about. Um, We, of course, read the story of Acts from a much later period of time than the early Christians did, but it has some of the same characteristics uh, for us as we're reading it that they would have picked up on. And that, I think, is because fundamentally the story of Acts is meant to solidify Christian sense of a Christian sense of their own identity as a people. And as such, it is really about the present, not just the past, is orienting the present understanding of those Christians to the past, but in a way that is supposed to give them a a greater sense of confidence, understanding of who they are and who their um, founders were, and what that should say about their uh, lives as Christians moving forward. I heard one of the the, uh, questions that came up in last week's discussion was, who is Theophilus? Theophilus, of course, is this person that Luke addressed in the preface of his gospel, Uh, and also in the prologue to the book of Acts that we are looking at. Um, We don't know, is the bottom line, who this figure was. Um, He could have been an individual, very well could have been an individual in the early Christian movement who Luke knew and was writing to. Um, But also he could have been a, a representative of all Christians. In other words, a Luke surely, even if he was writing to an individual named Theophilus, would have met and designed his work in Acts to be widely read and would have had both the present communities of Jesus followers in mind and as well as probably the future ones. So, so in real ways, we can see ourselves, hopefully, as we're reading this document as a type of Theophilus figure, um, desiring to be shaped by the narrative and, and its values uh, that Luke uh, conveys along the way. Okay, so we've, di- we've dispensed with some of the preliminaries. Noticeably, in this week's passage, we are looking at a speech. Last week, we looked at the origin, uh, founding oracle, really, of Jesus, uh, preceding his ascension up in heaven. This week, we are looking at uh, the speech that Peter gives. And so what we've seen here already, and I mentioned this a little bit, I think, last week, is that there's a passing of the torch. The disciples are witnesses now, or representatives of Jesus. They are the founding figures. He is the founder. And, you know, that has import for us as we think about ourselves kind of carrying on the torch or being public theologians in a way, and, and, and especially looking at this passage and the way that Peter uh, demonstrates learning about Israel's past in a way that helps inform his understanding of uh, the significance of Jesus' resurrection and what that means to early Christians. And that's something that we can think about as we look at what Peter does here. So, again, 
some of this may be repetitive and I may uh, circle back to ideas that I've covered at different points just to kind of really emphasize what I see is going on in this passage. So first of all, let's talk about speeches. Um, the speeches, speeches such as we find in Acts 2, play a big role in this wider story of, of this wider purpose of, of trying to tell the origin narrative of the Christian church. And that is because um, in the ancient world, first of all, speeches were an indeed an important form of communication, um, uh, both in live settings, in other words, before a real life audience, and as a medium in other types of literatures. They allowed orators and authors to present arguments, convey values, suggest behaviors, to teach, in other words. And Luke is aware of the importance of speech in these different manifestations. Anyone who reads Acts will notice that giving speeches or teaching is a characteristic activity of the apostles. Literarily, the speeches offer variety in what would otherwise be a fast-paced narrative, right? So we have a lot of action. And much as in the Gospels, these speeches uh, break up the action or help interpret or set the trajectory for the action. But there's also a theological reason for the speeches, right? Um, Luke wishes to demonstrate, as I showed in the last lecture, that the apostles imitate Jesus. They are his witnesses after all. And we are reminded in the preface of Jesus's words and teachings. Uh, Acts 1.1, what Jesus did and taught, right? So we are primed from this point on, um, having seen in the Gospels, Jesus is teaching to expect the apostles as witnesses um, to carry on and to teach themselves. So in addition to Acts 1 and 2, uh, Peter delivers a lot of speeches in Acts 3 through 5, 11, and 15, but he is not the only one who is depicted as an orator. Stephen offers a lengthy defense and rendition of Israel's history in Acts 7, defense of himself, that is. Um, James follows Peter in delivering public remarks at the so-called Jerusalem Council in Acts 15. And Paul, the Apostle Paul, gives a whole host of speeches in Acts 13, 14, 17, 20, etc. Many of the speeches um, in Acts, of course, are accompanied by noteworthy deeds, so acts of healing, miracle exorcism. So to kind of round out that comparison with Jesus, those, so the apostles are engaging in the same sorts of deeds and, and, and words that Jesus himself is. The nature of the speeches underscores the importance of having intercultural competence as a public theologian. Okay, then the speeches and acts that is. While they share a similar structure, the speeches vary in terms of their content, and typically this is so based upon geographical location. So speeches delivered in Jerusalem or in a synagogue outside, if outside of Judea, are most explicit in their reference to Jewish traditions and institutions, the ancestors, promises of God, the law, etc., much as we would expect. By contrast, speeches delivered outside of Jerusalem and not in a synagogue, mostly before Gentiles, in other words, tend to be more cosmic in their orientation. They highlight God's revelation through creation. At least one and probably two of these speeches also allude to Greco-Roman traditions, not exclusively Jewish ones, Acts 14 and 17. Like skilled preachers the world over, in other words, the apostles vary the form of their teaching according to the setting and audience. Okay, I'm going to pause here for a second, and I will do this throughout the lecture, just to give uh, us all a chance to reflect here on the nature of speeches uh, in the book of Acts and their purpose. And then we'll come back to give an overview of the speech in Acts 2. In this week's passage, Acts 2, 14 through 40, where the speech occurs, we are looking at what is actually the second delivered remarks of Peter in Acts. Peter delivered his first speech in response to the need to pick Judas Iscariot's successor, Judas being one of the disciples, the one who betrayed Jesus. Replacing Judas was a priority because the disciples had to continue their ministry as a 
body of 12, representing the former tribes of Israel. Let me begin by giving an overview of the speech and its context, then we will look more specifically at the details of the speech and what they can teach us about the rich possibilities of using salvation history to inform our own life and ministry. So here we have an overview of the speech. Uh, there were many species or categories of the speech, species being the technical language, in the ancient world. So what is the form of Peter's speech in Acts 2? Actually, it appears to be a mixture of sorts. The first part from verses 14 through 36 appears to be judicial, and the last part, verses 38 through 40, seems to be deliberative. I'll explain what each of these mean. The first and largest part of the speech is judicial, since here Peter is seeking to refute a charge, so thank the courtroom as an analogy. Specifically, the charge has been made against the early followers of Jesus who are speaking in strange tongues. Let us recall the wider context of Peter's speech. At the beginning of Acts 2, the followers of Jesus were gathered together during the festival of Pentecost. They then experienced what Jesus had forecast in Acts 1, our passage for last week, the coming of the Holy Spirit. This watershed event was accompanied by signs indicating a theophany or divine revelation, 2, 1 through 4. The most memorable of these signs was this, those upon whom the Spirit descended gained the ability to speak in different tongues, Acts 2, 4. Now, the way Peter, Luke relates the story, this meant that the Jesus followers communicated in non-native languages, right? So there's a debate about what speaking in tongues mean in the New Testament, and we seem to see something different here in, in Acts chapter 2 from what we see in, for example, Paul's letter to the Corinthians. Their speaking in tongues means speaking in a language that no one around except for God can understand. Here we really have an intelligible form of speech that just some people cannot understand because they don't understand the human language that is being communicated. The following events support this interpretation of speaking in tongues. It so happens that a great number of Jews from other countries had taken up residence in Jerusalem. They probably lived here and had not just come to Jerusalem for the, the festival. Um, they are residents, in other words, at this point. Um, and it's not surprising that they would do so. Jerusalem was, indeed, the holy city for many in the Jewish faith. But we must remember that it was not the city of origin for these particular Jews. So we might imagine that they retain cultural characteristics from their native regions, including languages spoken besides Aramaic and Hebrew. The miracle of Pentecost is that the Holy Spirit enabled Jesus' followers to speak in the native languages of those foreign-born Jews, Acts 2, 5 through 11. In Acts 2, 8 through 11, there is a list of these Jewish origins. This list is peculiar. Some of the locations no longer existed as political entities in the form Luke describes. It is odd here also to see Judea mentioned. What is so noteworthy about residents of Judea living in Judea? Lastly, it is notable that locations listed do not correspond to the geographical trajectory of Acts, meaning where the narrative goes after leaving Jerusalem. The list does not, in other words, offer a blueprint to Luke's narrative, like we see in Acts 1.8. No, the list of locations cannot be explained in any of these different ways. However, what this list of locations does is convey an expansiveness that is comparable to the function of Jesus' oracle in 1.8. In other words, the experience of the Spirit by Jews of disparate origins anticipates the witness to Jesus in and far beyond Jerusalem, to the end of the earth, we might say. Now, what is the reaction to this Spirit-inspired speech? Decidedly mixed, in fact. This is a common theme throughout Acts. Some are drawn in, others are repelled. Here, many were moved to wonderment and desired to have a further understanding of what was happening. Yet others ridiculed the Jesus followers, accusing them of drunkenness, 2.13. Now, Peter's speech is initially an attempt to disprove this charge. That's why we call it judicial. He's seeking to refute the charge of drunkenness. 
and he does so by stating the obvious to begin with. It is way too early to get drunk, 2.15. And then he goes on to propose an alternate explanation for the Spirit's manifestations. This explanation draws on and reinterprets Scripture. That is how the first part of the speech is functioning, like an argument of a defense attorney in court. What about the second part? This smaller section of the speech in verses 38 through 40 is what we might call deliberative. That is, it aims to convince the hearers to take a particular action. Peter's speech has thus far been fairly successful by the time we get down to 38 to 40. Quite a few have felt convicted by their role in opposing Jesus, God's agent of salvation. They fervently ask, brothers, what shall we do? 237. And it is this question that triggers that shift from judicial defense to deliberative rhetoric as Peter seeks to persuade the listeners to repent and be baptized, preconditions for receiving the Holy Spirit. Basically, the apostle is urging his fellow Jews to act in a way that will allow them to become part of God's story in Jesus. Now, to sum up, in the context of the narrative world here in Acts 2, Peter's speech has two functions to defend the legitimacy of the signs of the Spirit, and to persuade others to become part of what God is accomplishing through the resurrected Jesus. Now, that's the internal audience in the narrative. For the external audience, readers like ourselves, I suggest this speech is meant to be explanatory in different ways, or in several other ways. First, most basically, it explains how the Spirit came to be part of the church's experience of Christ. Right? This would be a defining mark of Christians throughout the ages, and this provides an explanation of how that defining experience began. Second, it profiles key founding figures in the faith, the apostles. And we see in Peter that the apostles emerge as teachers, learned teachers, able to draw out from Israel's sacred history things, quote, both new and old, Look at Matthew 13, 40, 52 for that reference. And therefore, third, the speech, is all, the speech also models how later generations of Christians can weave their own story together with the larger story of God's salvation historical work. Remember what I said, Acts as a narrative is really telling the story of the past, but it's orienting it to the, to the present and future most likely. Okay, so let me pause again before we dive into the Peter speech. Okay, let us now look at the speech in Acts chapter 2 in closer detail. It is clear here that the experience of Jesus shapes Peter's interpretation of Israel's scriptures. This is a crucial point. Peter begins with a quotation from Joel 2, 17 through 21, Joel being an Old Testament or Hebrew Bible prophet. And this quotation is designed to explain the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And then he very quickly transitions to God's work in Christ. Peter's eventual statement in 2, 32 through 33 makes explicit what is assumed from the beginning. And that is that Jesus's resurrection and exaltation is the precondition, the basis for the experience of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. Peter thus cites Joel as a prophetic forecasting of an event that is inextricably tied to the fuller story of God's salvation bringing actions through Jesus. So what can the way that Peter cites the prophet Joel teach us about how Luke understands God's work in Christ? Well, let's look at two aspects of the citation that I think are worth mentioning. First, it is notable that Peter frames the prophecy with the words, in the last days, 217a. Now, this temporal marker establishing a time frame alters or changes the afterword that we find in the Greek Old Testament source. The effect of this change from afterwards to in these last days is to establish a distinct era which includes the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and represents the climactic or eschatological, a fancy word meaning having to do with the end times, period of divine salvation history. Now, this era begins with Jesus' 
resurrection, exaltation, and extends all the way to his return. Now recall from last week's lecture how the angels notified the apostles after Jesus' ascension that he would return. And that's what we have as kind of the end of this end times or this outside frame that begins with Jesus' resurrection and exaltation. The entirety of Acts gives a glimpse of what is possible during this time. We see the church expand in boundless ways through the empowering work of the Holy Spirit. Again, this creative envisioning of the present as a critical time is made possible by the temporal framework that Peter establishes with, with these words in these last days when he cites Joel. Now, second, Peter's citation also configures the ethnic and geographical scope of God's work in Jesus. How does he accomplish this? Well, it has to do with the way Peter selects his text to resonate with the present work of God in Christ. Namely, Peter concludes his citation of Joel with the declaration, Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. 221. In the source text, Joel goes on to describe a particular concern for the fortunes of Judah to pronounce judgment upon the nations. Okay, so he moves from God will save Judah to God will judge the nations. Now, this latter section, judgment of the nations, runs counter to Peter's uh, and Luke's intentions here. Peter, the spokesman, has been taught, just like Luke, by the experience of Jesus' resurrection. The emphasis, therefore, is placed firmly on the universal dimensions of salvation, not judgment. Let's pause to reflect a bit on how Peter cites Joel and what it means for the engagement with Hebrew Bible or Old Testament traditions. Okay, now we are moving on to consider how Peter cites another ancestor, David. As I mentioned earlier, Peter moves pretty quickly from his explanatory citation of Joel to God's triumph in Jesus of Nazareth, uh, beginning in Acts 22, 22. He contrasts this triumph with the attempt of others to undermine the work of Jesus. This idea of opposition to the plans of God is one that runs throughout the book of Acts. But the large idea here is that God cannot be thwarted. Peter characterizes God's resurrection of Jesus as a victory over both his opponents and death itself. And here exactly is why he reaches back to the sacred history of the Jews to appeal to the ancestor David. Luke is not unique in what's going on here. Early Christians found traditions about David very meaningful in explaining the significance of Jesus. And Luke's sources here include passages from the Psalms and maybe also 2 Samuel in the Greek version of the Hebrew Scriptures. But what we might ask is, what role specifically does David perform in Peter's speech? How does Peter cite, use David to further his point? While Joel functioned primarily as a prophet forecasting the future, David acts as a prophet as well as one who prefigures God's work in Christ. If he is known as a king, though, David, how is it that he is also a prophet? And ultimately, is because he envisioned the resurrection, Peter contends. We can see this in the words that the apostle associates with David from the Psalms and how they point to a confidence in the face of death. The Lord is at my right hand, so I will not be shaken. My flesh will live in hope. 2, 25 to 26. Beyond confidence in the face of death, though, they also seem to imagine rescue from death. Quote, you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One experience corruption. 227. 228. You have made known to me the ways of life. And later in 231, he, meaning this figure, was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh experience corruption. End quote. The experience of Jesus' resurrection enabled early Christians like Peter in Luke to see these verses in a new light. Remember, I said that Peter's interpretation of the Davidic traditions and Joel traditions is shaped by the present experience of the resurrection 
they did not merely describe these passages rescue from death in battle, but rescue from death, period. David was known to have died. Peter says in 2.29, his tomb is with us to this day. And he most certainly did not, quote, ascend into the heavens, 2.34. Therefore, David must have been predicting the resurrection of another. And the most sensible conclusion is that David spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, 2.31. So this is the way that David functions for Peter as a prophet, pointing ahead to the resurrection of another, Jesus. Ultimately, Luke's familiarity with the sacred traditions of Israel, his learning, is what enables him to make these connections. But if David acts as a prophet for Peter, is that all he does? Is his role limited to predict, predicting the achievements of someone far grander than himself? No, I don't think so. I suggest that Peter's argument also implies that Peter prefigures Jesus. The root metaphor that Luke relies upon to facilitate this connection is raising up. This activity is implied in God's appointing David to be the king, then also in God's oath to, quote, put one of his, that is David's, descendants upon the throne, Acts 2.30. Peter explicitly, though, names this act of raising up in God's definitive act of raising Jesus from the dead, or resurrection, Acts 2.32. So what is the significance of Peter's implicit and explicit use of this root metaphor raising up? Well, for Luke, it seems to be that this represents a characteristic activity by which God accomplishes his saving purposes. Of course, David is not the only one who God raised up among the Jewish people throughout salvation history. One could point further to God's calling of luminaries such as Abraham and Moses. And in fact, other speakers later in Acts, Stephen in Acts 7, Paul in Acts 13, do reference these other figures that God has appointed. But for Luke, the connection to David is the most suggestive. And incidentally, this is also the case in Acts 13. On one side, David was appointed king of Judah. On the other, Jesus, by virtue of his resurrection, was exalted in a king-like position to the right hand of God. As both were ruling agents of God, Peter and Jesus, Peter is able to apply to Jesus what was originally spoken of in reference to David. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool, Acts 2, 34-35. Just as David was both a ruler and a savior of his people, Peter is able to draw the conclusion that even more definitively, God has made Jesus both Lord and Messiah. Acts 2.36. So what is accomplished by having the ancestor David prefigure Jesus? Why does Luke construct Peter's speech in this way? Above all, doing so makes God's work in Jesus more intelligible. God is shown to be working in this particular way, raising up representatives throughout salvation history. And therefore, by the same token, it makes the early Christians' experience of this resurrected Jesus part of this same salvation historical work of God. So there's continuity. It anchors the faith of Christians. And the same is true for Christian experience today to the extent that we learn about and steep ourselves in these scriptural traditions. Let me pause one last time for a reflection and discussion of the significance of Peter's use of David as a prophetic and anticipatory figure related to Jesus. So backing away again and looking at the speech as a, as a whole, uh, what is Peter's uh, handling of the ancestors in order to make this connection to Christ effect? Well, really, it's quite easy. In this passage, it leads to the significant reinforcement or augmentation of the early Christian community. Luke pointedly remarks on the effects of Peter's words, in fact, in Acts 2, 41 through 42. And next week, we'll look more specifically at the community practices of the nascent or early Jesus followers. But here it is sufficient to observe that the influx of new believers, 3,000 according to Luke, was a direct result of Peter's proclamation, Acts 2.41. Luke's further comment on the characteristic practices, 
of these Jesus followers solidifies the impression that what has been planted here is a distinct community. These practices, devotion to the apostles' teaching, breaking of bread and prayers, Acts 2.42, function as institutions defining the new body. So here's the takeaway point. Peter's speech is not tangential to the story of Acts. It is a pivotal vehicle, just like all the speeches in the narrative, in establishing the Jesus followers as a community. Later, Paul's speeches will be responsible for producing mixed or Jewish-Gentile communities in the lands beyond Judea. But Luke begins with Peter's speech in Acts 2 in order to follow the basic blueprint set forth in Acts 1.8, right, beginning in Jerusalem. Even so, the wider context of Acts 2 is important. We talked about this context at the beginning of the lecture. Many of the hearers of this speech are Jews from abroad who have just taken up residence in Jerusalem. In other words, the universal implication of pro the proclamation are never far from view. In conclusion, we've been considering the function of the ancestors in Peter's speech. What about the relevance of Peter himself? Specifically, what is the relevance of what Peter is doing in this passage, referencing the ancestors, connecting him to Jesus? How does that relate to contemporary Jesus followers like ourselves? I would suggest that, among other things, Luke offers Peter as an exemplar not as a moral paragon, but as an example of public witness. Notice how the author, Luke, sums up the end of the apostle's speech. Quote, and he testified with many other arguments and exhorted them, saying, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Acts 2.40. We need not adopt those final words to admire Peter's sense of purpose as a witness to the resurrection of Jesus. And here's the important point. Peter's witness encourages a certain disposition among others who would walk in his path. This is the ability in being a public witness or a public theologian to make connections between the present experience of Christ and God's story of salvation stretching into the distant past. What kind of learning would it take for all of us to begin to make these kinds of connections? I'm not talking about dry antiquarian interest. Instead, I'm referring to the interest in the sacred past for the sake of the present. How can God's penchant for intervening in the lives of people, raising up and speaking through representatives, acting to save? How can a knowledge of this sort of history inform our public witness today? In truth, it is not only the present that is at stake. How can our approach to the salvation historical past also orient us towards the future and set our priorities? What I'm asking here for all of us is, how can we learn to make connections like Peter does? Welcome to Your Week with St. Luke's, our Office Hours podcast. My name is Jen Stiles Williams, and today we're discussing the rhythm of what it means to learn as a student of the story and a student of Jesus. Today I'm joined by Jad Denmark, who is pastor of our Grow Ministries, Liz Vasquez, who's Director of Adult Spiritual Formation and Ministries, and Tom Hoback, who's one of our longtime St. Lukers and a learner of Jesus. So we're going to just jump right in um, with our introduction. So tell me a little bit about how long you've been at St. Luke's and a little bit about yourself as a learner of Jesus. I'm going to go first then. Yeah. Everyone's looking at me. Um, I've been here nine years. I'm in my 10th year as appointed pastor at St. Luke's. Um, and... Um, Learning is, is something I've always thought um, that is just a key part of discipleship. It's a key part of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. It's an emphasis that we've had here at St. Luke's. And so um, and it's been my whole experience, my time here. It's been learning. Uh, we came to St. Luke's probably 21 years ago, I want to say. Um, we uh, Being in the entertainment industry... Uh, consistent worship time was very frustrating and sometimes impossible for us. So St. Luke's provided enough diversity to um, address that. And um, lo and behold, the content and the people in the ministry resonated with us as well. So we've stayed. Um, it certainly wasn't the beginning of my journey, I suppose. 
um, you never stop or you, you start learning as soon as you um, get taken home from the hospital. But um, my spiritual learning probably started in my youth group in high school. And that's when I, you know, to use old terminology, became a Christian and was reborn and accepted Jesus um, because of the love environment that I was exposed to. And the, it wasn't a salvation from anything kind of experience. It was more of a, um, wow, this concept of a loving God is real. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I want to be a part of it. Right. And so um, I, that journey has taken me through different pursuits of fellowship from a um, charismatic prayer community in a, in a Catholic community sure. oh. in Key West to... Uh, a cup of coffee with the Baptists, um, a Presbyterian um, college, got my degree at Whitworth University in Spokane, Washington. Um, and um, I guess that, that constant seeking and constant mm-hmm. finding a place that resonated a loving God. That's and awesome. That's beautiful. I love that. A, a charismatic Catholic community in Key West. I don't know that I've always heard all of those words <laughs> right. together. Yeah. And it's beautiful. That is so great. It Thank was very, you. yeah, it was, it was really, really uh, unique and obviously, um, but a very warm experience. That's great. That's tough to follow. Yeah. But so I am a church baby. Uh, I grew up in a family where if the church doors were open, we were there. And if they were closed, we were probably there cleaning or something, right? <laughs> so I, my earliest memories are, like, learning Bible stories and, like, scripture memory verses and, and like, Bible drills with my mom at bedtime, um, like, as a really young child. So I've just kind of always been a lifelong learner. But I was also a questioner. And so growing up in a different tradition, that was not always encouraged. So mm. at St. Luke's, we've been here for about five years, and I'm definitely— um, excited about that part, right? Like right. that idea of wrestling with your faith and that being allowed and that actually meaning that you are in close relationship with God. So that's it. So it's it's interesting. My husband and I were talking, we've been here 14, it'll be 15 years in January. And it's, it's, it's interesting to watch St. Luke's as we kind of grow. Um, and, and we've always talked about discipleship and that being very important here at St. Luke's. Um, but I'm, I'm watching people dig even deeper into the story than maybe they have before. And I think part of it is this rhythm that we're offering. We're asking people to be a part of this learn, live, love, and then lead your life. And so we've used this word learn um, to talk about learning God's story, God's story of, of Jesus, God's story of scripture, but God's story also in theology and learning to talk about God and to really claim it for ourselves rather than just having it dispensed by right. a pastor right. or a teacher. So what does that word learn mean to you, especially in terms of learning the sacred text and the stories and the stories that are even not even in the scripture? Yeah. What does learn mean to you? You know, I was thinking as, as everyone was sharing, one of the worst things they do to pastors when they graduate from seminary is they say, uh, now you are a master of all things divine, which, you know, <laughs> they can't open the doors wide enough for our heads to get through. Um, but th- because there's so much more to learn, no matter what field of study, uh, you get a degree in it, but that's in the, in the ceremony, it's called the commencement, right? You're moving out into life to learn more um, in the world. And so um, that's always been a part of, of what learn means for me. It's life. Life is, should be always an experience of learning, um, that everything is an opportunity to, to make uh, changes and adapt. And that's learning. You, you, you change when you learn how you behave, how you speak, how you live your life. So uh, for me, learning is integral to living, so to life, and especially life and faith. I think for me, it's how you define learning and getting out of the concept of learning means finding the right answer. Mm, yeah. But learning is embracing. Mm-hmm. Um, if you embrace the process, if you're seeking, maybe that's a better mm-hmm. parallel to to learning, but you know, I think we fall into a, um, it's kind of like hitting the gas on a cul-de-sac if you're thinking that you're, you're, you're seeking an answer. Mm-hmm. Um, that, I think, by definition, truncates learning. Um, um, so it's not about the answers, it's about embracing the process for me. Nice. Right. 
I love that because you're a part of that, of the study living the questions. And I think that's what learning is. It's about learning to live with the questions mm -hmm. wherein we find lots of different answers or, or guesses or... Being okay with a question being a question. Right. And right. that is your driver from day to day, maybe. Mm -hmm. Just living that question. Mm -hmm. And as a child, I often often heard, since I mentioned I was a questioner, well, wait till you get to heaven and you can ask that question. <laughs> <laughs> I was not very happy with that answer. And so something I think of, like, just from being a teacher also, is, like, you know somebody has learned something when they can apply it in a different setting. And when I look at, like, the New Testament and the, the stories that we read there, a lot of what they were doing was reinterpreting the stuff they had learned before in a new context. I don't think you can do that if you don't learn the stuff to begin with, right? So I think it's like that's that cyclical journey. Like you have to really know something. It has to be a part of you and you have to find yourself in that story so that you can live your life. That's interesting because our scripture that goes with this particular Sunday and this week has to do with Peter being empowered by the Holy Spirit after Pentecost, and he gets up and he preaches. And he preaches not only the story of Jesus, but he preaches the rest of the story that he had learned. And so he was not only a student of Jesus, but he was a student of the Torah and, and, and understand it and knew it. It's not like it suddenly came to life the moment that the, the Spirit hit him to, to preach the sermon. And I, I think that's one of the things that we get tripped up on as people of faith is that we think all of a sudden in the midst of the crunch time, in the midst of the crisis, we're going to have the answers or or suddenly we're going to have a revelation and be able to tell our story or tell God's story. But it really takes being a student of the story long before the crisis or crunch time hits. So right. Right. discipleship, disciple means student. So what does it mean for you to be a student of God, a student of Jesus, a student of this story? What does that mean for you? For me, I think it's more than just a story. It's also looking at characters and seeing what would they have done? How would this information or knowledge have affected their lives? And again, how, they, how would they have applied it to a new setting? Yeah, I think for me too, it's not restricting ourselves to one channel of pursuit um, that when you're when what it means to be a, a learner, I think is being open to various sources of input. Mm -hmm. um, when when you have different theologians and authors who have studied and devoted their entire lives to certain theological questions, they might be worthy of of um, investigation, right. even every bit as much as a Bible study, mm -hmm. um, because it's that application in a setting. Um, so I think being a learner, it, for me, is um, kind of opening the doors to input, mm -hmm. um, being diverse in, the, in, the, in what you're exposed to, and that even from persons of other faiths, they can bring different perspectives of their pursuit of divinity and a divine one um, that we can learn from. Well, and that's that open door that you were talking about before. Like, to, to think that um, we know all things, and we, we can discover all things. We've got, we've got the keys to the kingdom. We, under, we, we know how that is. It's is to limit what knowledge is what, and to limit what God is, right? So for me, what you're saying is so beautiful because it's that opening that door wider to say, oh, God's capable of teaching me in all kinds of interesting and powerful and transformative transformative ways. Um, I think about as a disciple of Jesus, there's an old Talmudic um, uh, blessing. May you be um, caked in the dust of your rabbi. And it's for students, it's for disciples, that you would follow your rabbi, your teacher, so closely that, that the, the dirt from the road would just be caked on you. Uh, and that's hard for us as Christians because we can't literally walk physically with Jesus. It, yeah, you know, he's here with us spiritually. Um, but that's part of that pursuit of, of opening scripture. That's part of that community. So being a disciple of Jesus is, is, for me, is seeking to be covered, caked in the dust of his feet, uh, following him so closely. But that happens through, through scripture, through community, through small group discussion, um, and through like you said, opening our doors to, to more possibilities of what God is about, mm -hmm. what Christ is about. So it's interesting because I heard a pastor say once, how big is your bandwidth? Mm 
You know, mm-hmm. are you only listening? Is your bandwidth only with the, the decibels that you can hear or that you agree with? Or can you sit and wrestle with theologians or stories or or people that you disagree with and still trust the spirit to teach you something? And it's it's interesting because I think too, we as 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 Methodists, the way we see the sacred story is not literal. Um, it's bigger. And that there are other texts and other traditions that we can come to and find God, which allows me to constantly be a student and know that like maybe one time 10 years ago, I read something that I didn't agree with, but that all of a sudden it, it, it shapes me now. It it makes a difference to me now. It's like, oh, oh, now I see what that person was saying. So what about you? How have you grown in your discipline of being a student of the story or student of Jesus? For me, it's knowing that I'm never finished, um, that um, it's, it's almost fascinating. And, and, the, and when you, you know, when you come out with new movies and new TV shows, you go, oh, what's that? Well, it's simply, it's a new season. There's a new season of learning ever, through life. And to, when, you, when you take away that paradigm of seeking answers, you then are just seeking experiential knowledge or relational knowledge, um, learning. Um, so for me, it's simply defining the process as open-ended and um, that God is the one with the answers. We're not. Mm-hmm. So, but, we, but there's, there's almost a paradox in that, yet we are, just, we are called to follow that. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we've, we sometimes trap ourselves into thinking we're trying to fall, to seek, well, it's the Garden of Eden, you know, metaphor of, you know, now we're trying to seek the, the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Um, but if you get away from that and say, no, no, don't make that your pursuit, but still you do pursue God and his character. Mm-hmm. Um, that when you, it's kind of like when you start living the question, sometimes you live the paradoxes too. Mm, right, right. Anyone else want to jump in there on, like, how have you grown? So I think just, I would say from, like, in my whole life, um, I've grown from being more of a literist, right, from looking at the the gospel as something that necessarily, or not the gospel, but just the whole Bible, right? So literal, and also when I learned to study the context of the scriptures and the people that wrote it, I think that was a big breakthrough for me, um, because what it would have meant whenever it was written is not what it's going to mean today, so that was big. I mean, for me, it, it's been um, learning to keep my mouth shut. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah I, I'm always talking in my head, and, um, uh, and that comes from deep insecurity of having to feel like I have to prove myself and prove what I know. Um, and But then there's my theology of appreciating the other. And so if I'm talking, they're not. So I've, I've, I work really hard to grow, t- to learn to listen to people. And that means being okay with the silence. And, um, but it also is deeply rooted in my, my theology of appreciating what the other has to bring to the table and share. And so I'm, I'm not there yet, um, but that's something I'm learning more and more as I learn about myself and how I want to apply um, the things I hold dear, my theology, to how I live. I mean, that's, that's never easy. It's not, you know, I'm perfected in salvation. <laughs> but it's, it's a long journey in growing to being uh, more, uh, more, more faithful to learning from other people because there's so many other voices that I can learn from. So the whole point of what I've learned over the last few years is that really the the point of the church is is to tell the sacred story and empower people to go and be what what we call public theologians, to go out into the public and to tell the story of God and to tell your story and to 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 be a, a living theology in the world that makes a difference. So we've talked about our individual stories. This whole month is about how our stories together shape the story that St. Luke's and St. Lucas tell in the world. So how does learning the sacred story together make you a better public theologian? Well, I think... When you learn it in community, it's so different, right? If I read a text by myself, my experience is going to be different 
than what you experience or what someone else experiences. So when we read it together, it's just that much more powerful because I'm not just learning from the text. I'm learning from your experience as well. And so that feeds into my interpretation. And because I realize that this thing that was written hits you in a different spot, then I see it differently now. And it makes me more human almost. That's true. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's vulnerability there. Yeah. Right? yeah. Um, I think of, um, I had the great blessing of learning from Luke Timothy Johnson. He's a New Testament scholar. And uh, he would put us in reading groups for our, what's called exegesis process, but reading our scriptures and not reading them in isolation by ourselves. That the, you you need pushback from other people. You need to hear, like I was saying before, somebody else's, I did, totally didn't hear it that way. Like, that's fairly interesting. And how reading scripture in isolation is kind of goes against what scripture is to be. And that goes back to the, the rabbis who say, you know, where two or more are gathered, God said, Christ said, I'll be with you. That's that's going to the rabbis saying, we, we read together. We, we, we read in community. Um, so, I mean, that's what I think is so exciting about these, these four L words that lead us um, as we learn and love. And, uh, but is that it's, it's encouraging us to continue to be in smaller groups where we can learn from each other and we can push back against each other with love and gain more perspective. And that, that's learning. So, um, and that's, I think it's powerful and important. Yeah. And um, you, you mentioned that reading by yourself versus in groups, just the idea that we can <clears throat> go and, and um, figure out life in a silo is, is a contradiction in terms. You, yeah. you just can't. Um, it for, but for me, the, the idea of learning and then bringing it into the community is always bringing it back um, to representing what God is. Is there a consistency, consistent through line in what we're doing, what we're saying, and what we're believing that reflects the character of God? Um, and uh, to me, that's a, always been a touchstone of, of what I've chosen to do and, and how I've chosen to live my life, um, is, that, is, that a, is that a reflection of um, that through line of consistent character of God, which, you know, I love the, our sort of um, phrase from the church is love wins. That's right. Mm-hmm. You know, to me that defines any, like you said, the tolerance of being in a group together in a discussion to any kind of um, mission work that's going on outside the church um, to the relationships within the church. Thank you guys so much. This is a great conversation. We hope everybody who's listening, um, this was a great segue into next week's, which is going to be about live and how do we live in community, the story together. Um, I thank you for sharing. And for everyone who's listening, I hope that you have a great week of learning the story um, so that you can go out and be a public theologian that tells us that love wins. Until next week.